everybody. Um, so I'm here with all my uh, fancy project, fancy uh, presentation gear, and I guess I kind of feel like I'm some motivational speaker or something who's come out and been stuck in kind of the small room, but he's still going to try to convert everybody in the audience anyway. So um, what I'm going to talk about is kind of some thoughts that I've been mulling over for the past year or so, and there's nothing that, you know, is earth shattering or final or anything, but I thought it was interesting enough to present a talk about, and uh, I've been looking at this Nix thing, which is a... Uh, Linux distribution, basically, but also a package manager that you can throw onto OS X or whatever, Debian. Uh, and there were some interesting ideas in there, and I'm going to go through some of them, but I thought I'd start here with this Haskell DAV, which is a library that Clint wrote. So I knew Clint would be here. He had the talk right before mine. If you look at the uh, source code of it, here's the source code, 444 lines of Haskell to implement a web dev interface that's quite convenient to use. Um, and here's the control file, which is, you know, more than a quarter the size of the uh, entire source. Um, down here is all the metadata that, that gets distributed as part of the Haskell package. And uh, I wanted to just make you sit through this because when you're maintaining something like this and everything is repeated three times and has bounds on it that have to be updated when Clint changes things. Of course, Clint is normally doing all this work. But I was stuck working with it earlier, too. And I was like, gosh, it just keeps on going forever. And then, of course, there's more, because let's repeat everything a few more times, just because, you know, why not? Um, ah. Oh, and then there's this. So let's just repeat this part, as is completely unchanged three times with different package names, because, you know, why not? Uh, and we've got this fantastic new technology that lets us not duplicate the entire description three times and cut and paste it every time you edit it. Um, so uh, this seems pretty crap. <laughs> I mean, I'm, it really does. And there's a lot of them. I don't know if these numbers are really accurate, but I got somewhere around 844 for the Haskell group. Of course, the Perl group has like the entire universe. And then there's the Python group and the whatever Java blah, blah, blah. So it's like, what, 50% of the archive or something is just fairly redundant stuff, I think. I mean, it's insane. <laughs> so we're doing a lot of make work. And of course, Enrico's already talked all about this in his talk. So he kind of stole some of my thunder. But this is, I find this really annoying. And it really reduces my motivation to work on something when I have to go edit everything three times and everything. So here is the equivalent from the new religion that I wanted to talk about. It's still not really great, actually. It's repeating everything at least twice. Uh, but you'll notice the first odd thing about it is that it does look kind of like some piece of JavaScript or something. It's actually some little language. And uh, it's got a hash in there. Some other weirdness about jailbreaking, which I have no idea what that's <laughs> about. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> Uh, this is a package management system that runs on all kinds of OSs, so there's probably some complications, but it's definitely shorter. <laughs> uh, I don't think it looks horrendous. It, it's obviously not suitable for Debian, but it's kind of an interesting point of, wow, they actually made this package, you know, shorter, so that's nice. And then, so I was thinking about this, and I'm like, well, what is the actual entropy in that package that I showed you? And here is every line that you know, couldn't be inferred pretty easily, and I think the standard version could also be inferred pretty easily, and probably some other things. And I just threw in a couple of uh, little, you know, kind of, this is some kind of made up template language where you could just say, oh, just go, you know, sh expand all the other lines, please. Um, if you remove the little template language bits, I think this is identical to Enrico's dev dry. So, you know, <laughs> I'm glad we both came up with that. Uh, so that's, you know, that's OK. I don't like little template languages. Maybe Enrico's thing is a very brilliant simplification, but here's another attempt at it. Uh, this is valid Haskell code. I haven't bothered to write the actual back end, which would be like a few functions. Uh, so in here, we have a source package. And um, you know it just says it's in the web, and it has the standards version. Then the packages section 
Uh, well, I should first say that both of these are functions from some kind of representation of the source package to some kind of representation of the data that we actually want. So it may look like it's just saying, oh, the source is this, but it's actually saying, oh, go pull the source out of this reader own ad and then do whatever you want to get out the value that you would like. That's what I'm assuming. I haven't written the code yet, uh, or I'm ever. Um, <clears throat> um, so then this next thing, you know, the, the idea here is there's going to be some kind of a Haskell libraries function that just goes and figures out, you know, all the metadata makes Haskell library. And then there's this also backtick thing, which is just standard syntax. It says, oh, there's also a package hdav, which is then going to be defined by these following lines. This is all made up, but it would actually work just fine. Um, it's probably, <coughs> I don't think it's that scary looking. I'm using pretty similar syntax to this in my propeller project. I just kind of stole it. Uh, but I think what it shows you is that once you get a, a language and preferably something that's referentially transparent and referentially transparent and functional, you can kind of start refactoring and end up with something that looks, you know, clear to read, clearish to read, and I think extensible and a lot better than what we have now. I'm not going to claim that this is any better than Rico's Debra at all, but it's an interesting alternative, I think. Uh, so, hello? Okay. Uh, so I wanted to look at some types just because why not? We're talking about Haskell y stuff. Um, this is the current type, and it, it's basically just a control file, duh. Um, you can see my little bullet points. I wouldn't take, th I'd take these with a grain of salt because everybody can have an opinion about things, but it definitely has a, you know, a nice simplicity to it as far as it's really easy to learn this. You know, you can just look at it and learn a few RFC 822 format things. You know all you need to know, really. Um, here's what people have, I believe, tried, haven't they? Wasn't there some Yada or some such thing long ago that, like, went in and said, oh, we'll just have some executable program that you have to run before you can build your package, and that was thoroughly laughed out at Debian, and I think the FP masters would now just reject it out of hand. Uh, but, uh, you know, it has some benefits, too. You can make a, you could make a control file or other files in the package and make them as simple as you want and have all the code off there doing its own thing be refactored out and use whatever languages you liked, you know, but it's probably completely insane it wouldn't fly because you really don't want unpacking a source package to, you know, grep for your, all your passwords and email them off someplace and whatever. Uh, so, let's see. Pre-generated control files, I think this is basically how I would characterize uh, DevDry. It basically goes off and runs some, you know, does some I.O. and makes a control file, a lot of control fi. Um, and uh, there we go. Um, and of course, DevDry also generates other things. And you could even say that it's not really pre-generating them. I don't know, Enrico. How would you characterize it? Do you think it's fair to say that you're every time you're doing I/O and generating the file when you're using DevDry? You every time you build, you would run the program and it would go off and do whatever and make the file. Every time you yeah. change that the end slash. Okay, so yeah, you are you make a modification and you have to run it again. Yeah. But otherwise you don't have to run it again. So this isn't completely accurate. Um, and, you know, I think it's awesome actually. I think people will probably be switching to it soon. Um, yes. Uh, please repeat the question. Yes. Or you would, or you the okay, well, I think I was clear there, but I forget exactly what I asked Enrico, but I believe it was something along the lines of, am I accurate in this? And, you know, he clarified that, yeah, you don't have to run it every time. Um, but I, I also think that if people speak up a little bit, the people in the stream might be able to hear you. And this is kind of what I'm worried about with this, is the whole issue of, you know, you have a thing that you're generating just like auto-make, auto-conf, all that stuff. You end up with an auto-generated file. What happens if somebody forgets that it's auto-generated and then it goes and edits it? What happens if the tools break and then you have an auto-generated file that can't be reproduced from source and get a valid package or a package that you want to upload or whatever? 
So I think these are issues. They're obviously issues that can be dealt with, but they are downsides to this. And Enrico, if you want to say something or anybody else, please, you know, you know, I think I think it's valid concerns, right? Lost. Okay, I'm sorry. You were apparently doing something else when I was talking to you. Uh, I missed that you were um, talking. Yeah. So what I'm saying is that I think that having this these auto-generated files can have the same problems as auto make, auto comp, and so on. You know, all the problems that we're familiar with. Probably the worst of them would be if you had a package that had generated the Debian directory that worked, and then some change broke it. And now yeah. you're what are you going to do? Um, I, b I like to think that DebDry is a transition tool rather than a final tool. Okay. And uh, so I would like DebDry to be an excuse to have auto debianization tools end up being doing all the work based on minimal input that could be like a configuration of the auto debianization tool. And at that point, there is no need of DebDry. You mm -hmm. just run a script that generates Debian using upstream metadata and uh, some extra local bits. Okay, right. Um, but that still leaves you in the position of not really having a solution to that problem, right? I mean, if the script that you're running, whatever it is for the particular language or package, you know, is not part of the package and changes, then things can break. Yeah. And so you have to have interfaces, you have to worry about, you know. Um, uh, yeah, I would hope yeah. that, that that fits into the domain of sanity of the auto debianization tool for that language which, if it's well written, it will hopefully not just be a hack of uh, thingies, but some have some clear interface that says this is yep. a Python package right. that mm -hmm. has these right. extra dependencies that cannot be represented there. And by the way, the, main, the Debian maintainer is not the same as upstream. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that's it. Yeah. So, so you, have to have, you have to have interfaces. And, you know, yeah, that makes sense. Um, let me move on. Uh, so this is what I proposed up above, which is where you have some kind of an upstream source representation that gen gener then generates not a control file, but some piece of control data, which then tools can use. Uh, and like I said before, obviously you can get rid of a lot of boilerplate that way, um, pretty much all of it. Maybe there's some wrinkles from your programming language that you've picked. Uh, and you know you don't have the problem of the one up here where you run the you know, some weird program that generates a control file. If you're using a purely functional programming language, you can limit what it does and you can say, no, it can't read files outside the package. It can't actually, you know, do any IO at all, no syscalls, whatever you really want to do to lock it in can be done. But of course, speaking of lock in, you're probably only going to be limited to one language if you do this. And this can be a problem. Of course, we have the rules file that is already limited to one language. So, you know, I used to think that was a bad idea, but now it seems like it might have been okay. Uh, so anyway, this was just, you know, one thing that I wanted to talk about. I want to move on away from just generating control files because I think personally that DebDry is going to shift the conversation and we'll see where we end up. Uh, but what I thought was interesting about this is this NixOS idea of uh, taking, you know, just standard functional programming language concepts and applying them to a distribution kind of gives you an insight into the problem space um, and, and a different solution than all the ones that have come before and a, one, and a solution is in some ways better. So I actually wanted to now do something kind of crazy and uh, demo NixOS in front of Debian at DebConf, yeah. uh, which is weird because I'm not a NixOS guy really um, and I have to figure out how to use this slightly odd setup here. Okay. So, um, hmm, let me make that a little bit bigger. Okay, so this is the NixOS uh, boot <laughs> screen using Grub. Um, I have some notes which I can't read anymore. Let me make this a little bit smaller. Okay, because <laughs> I'm not going to remember all these crazy NixOS commands. So, um, you know, it's just a Linux system. And, uh, you know, it uses UDEV like everything else. It has bugs like everything else. Uh, okay, so let me show you a few funky things about this normal Linux distribution. Okay, can you read that in the back? If you can't, I can't fix it. 
because it's obviously at a console. But look here, we have uh, bash is linking to slash nick slash store slash 9y blah 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 dash read line. So that's lib read line is in some wacky place, and so is every other library. Um, and uh, you'll notice that uh, lib history is in the same place as lib read line because it comes from the same upstream source. Other things have a different crazy hash because they come from someplace else. So, in fact, if we look through the tree, well, let me show you where bash is, because that's also, of course, in a crazy place. <laughs> it's in run. run. Yes. Um, why not? Yeah. Um, uh, let's find the entire user directory, because, yeah, there's got to be lots of stuff in user, right? Yeah, there's user bin env, because you can't move that, obviously. <laughs> and if you look at the entire system, bin is the same. There's bin sh or something. Um, um, yeah. Um, so let's look at this run current system. There's stuff in here. I don't really understand it, but I believe it's the entire system somehow. Oh, oh I, uh, let's see. Um, I think it's SW. Yeah. There's the system. So it's, it, it all still is there in some crazy place that'll go away when I reboot. Um, okay, what next? Oh, next is I have to use this. Okay, um, right. And just for clarity, those are all symlinks, right? Yo, it's all symlinks all the way down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, you know, Docker uses funky Linux features, and this just uses symlinks. Nothing else. Yeah. Um, no. Uh, Nix. Yeah, this is a very long man page with very many warnings. Uh, the interesting thing about this is there's one config file, which is configuration.nix, and that is, that is the config file. There is no other configuration. So this man page is rather long. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. Yeah. I haven't quite finished reading it. <laughs> <laughs> could somebody, like, could somebody just put their finger here? While you're going? <laughs> oh God! Whoa! <laughs> and uh, one guy. Yeah. <laughs> are, you, are you surprised? Six years. That's um, per day. <laughs> so here is the config file, and this is where you define the system. And you may notice that this looks a lot like that previous Nix file that I showed you, which is some JavaScript-ish looking language. And yeah, it's the same language. Um, oh, and this is definitely not gonna work here. Um, <clears throat> so it's doing things like saying, yeah, my bootloader is grub and it's installed here. And also here's all the packages that I want to install. Let me install NetHack because that's something that every system yeah. should have. Yeah. And then, so. huh? Yeah, well, <laughs> Nix OS DI does. <laughs> oh shoot! What did I do wrong? Oh, you, okay, yeah. I don't have a curse. I don't have a cursor, so it's kind of hard to. I don't know why it, it normally does. It's something about this presentation. Oh, it's I do up here. Okay, that's just funky. Um, so what I've just done is told it. Oh yeah, go look at the file and make the system look how I told you to make it look, and then. I should have showed you, of course, NetHack wasn't installed, but trust me, it wasn't installed, and now it is. Um, and all I've done is edited some crazy config file. Okay, so, <clears throat> right. I don't know if this is a good idea, but I'll try it. It says to install git annex now. I have no idea if this will work. Oh, what did I do? Wrong? Thank you. Um, Okay, yeah. Yeah, I find their syntax <coughs> not what I would expect in every way, but it works. Uh, why was this? Oh, oh no. Oh, it worked. Okay. Can <laughs> <laughs> you do that noise again? No. <laughs> so what I want to show you here is I've installed Git Annex. It's available. Now if I run uh, nixenv list generations, I get three generations. Um, the current one is where I installed git annex, the previous one is where I installed NetHack, and the other one is where I installed the system. 
so I can roll back to these if I want to. Um, so I'll roll back. Git Annex is not installed. Let me make sure. Yeah, but NetHack still is. And I can prove to you that it wasn't installed before. Oh, it was. I lied. Whoops. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> anyway, you saw that I rolled Git Annex back. So this rollback thing works. It's just that I don't quite understand the packaging system. Yes. Um, and yeah, it might have changed. I might have done it wrong. Ah, uh, now I'm back to one. Um, oh, you can. I just don't know how. <laughs> Um, <laughs> everything is still there because let me, uh, oh, here's where I should have showed you. Um, this is Nick's store. This is where everything actually goes. Um, so like if I go into this uh, handy ZW37, uh, yeah, uh, and then I can run find and it's uh, some crazy X library. Okay, that's handy. Um, <laughs> so you know, everything goes in the store directory, and it's actually a lot like Sto or something like that in some ways, I think. I haven't used Sto. Mad Duck has a point. You can just security yell. Team. How does the security team feel about this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, how does the security team feel about this? The NixOS security team or the Debian security team? If I'm you're not looking at Debian something. through a functional lens yeah. and you're showing us right. these sort of things, I want to yeah. know what the security team thinks. Well. Um, NixOS, I know, does some wackiness with SUID binaries, but otherwise I don't know what you're asking exactly. Oh, just it seems like there's going to be um, a... 100 versions of SunMail. Yeah. Yeah. I actually think that it, um, w when you set up the system, it actually probably... I know it does something about SUID, and since you've mentioned it, I'm pretty sure now that what <laughs> is it because it turns the right bit on or something, because you obviously don't want them all floating around. Um, but what, of course, what this does mean is that um, Linus was ranting last night about how horrible it is that we can't provide a consistent environment for an app. Well, if you build a NixOS app, it's a consistent environment with hashes pointing to the version of the package that was built. And they don't have fully reproducible builds, but they do have every input to that package also as part of the hash of that package and all the way up. So if you build something on NixOS, it's going to keep working until the Linux kernel breaks it. <laughs> kind of cool. Um, and this can be installed as a normal user. So that's kind of neat. Um, can I get install Nix right now? Hmm? Can I app get install Nix I right now? Know. I've never used the, the user mode version. You might be able to. OK. So I think uh, I, I'll show people other stuff if there's anything that people are interested in that I can possibly figure out. But I think you get the basic idea. It's just, you know hash-based packages. And I think a better way to explain this, let me get this out of the way again, is, uh, okay, well, that's really big now, um, is that we basically have a functional runtime system, which is the NixOS distribution, and the runtime is these little scripts of, snip of script that I've showed you. So if you look at any I think, I'm not a functional guru by any means, but I think these are the three big things you'll probably find in your functional language runtime. You're gonna have immutable data, you know, you're gonna have, you know, there's some value and it can't be changed, that's why it's functional. Um, if you do need to change it, well, you make a copy of it and then you modify one little bit of it. So it's copy on write, and it has garbage collection because these other things require that, and that's the only way we found to solve not blowing up, and NixOS has garbage collection. Uh, Nixn delete generation, that's kind of complicated, but you can say, oh, I installed a new version of GitAnnex or DentHack or some other useful program, and I don't want the old one, so I'm gonna go delete the old generations and then compact everything and free up disk space. And you know, these things are pervasive now, aren't they? You can kind of look, you can kind of look at Docker and Git and Nix and squint and see that you're kind of looking at the same thing. And you can look at the Haskell runtime system and squint and see the same thing. And I think this is fascinating. Um, I think there's something going on here. And maybe the Nix people have figured it out a lot better than the rest of us. But it's very, it's fascinating to me that these things are converging in this way. Um, and that was the main thing I wanted to hit when this talk is, you know, I. Uh, I don't think any of these things, except for maybe Git, are at their endpoint either. And so if we think about where these things are going, we might end up 
anticipating something interesting or maybe building it ourselves, Colin. Just yell or whatever. Sure, either way. Cheers. Um, there's a thing that we've been doing for the uh, for the Ubuntu phone project. Because for phones, you want uh, this kind of app management as well. So you want uh, third-party apps that you don't need to uh, necessarily upgrade along with the rest of your system, and you don't want to have to fight with deep good going wrong on a phone and all that sort of thing. Um, so we we have a thing called Click, which is basically unpacks uh, apps into a contained directory. It's a little bit like Stowe, it's a little bit like Nix in some ways. Uh, relies on, rather than doing this sort of clever, this clever hash based thing, um, it just requires some strict ABI management in, in the rest mm -hmm. of the system and uh, anything, that, anything that breaks apps is forbidden, etc. Right. Um, so that's, a, that's another Example of uh, of this kind of thing, and it's actually in, in some ways it's maybe not necessarily a terrible fit for integration with things like Docker as well in the future. So I don't know where that's going. Um, I don't know how it will help with uh, uh, with being used on Debian with a different set of and, and in some ways a much more diverse set of underlying ABIs. Um, but uh, but it's another thing to to throw into the pool. Um, I'd I'd been going to uh, to do a talk at DevCon, but it didn't fit into the schedule. So let me know if you're interested. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, that's interesting. I'm sure there's more things like that out there too, because it's you know it is where things seem to be going. There's more hashes in the world and more. more uh, we're, yeah. We're certainly not the only people to have done that kind of app management. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Linus may not have looked at it very much, but there's things like uh, Zero install, which yeah, are kind of in the same space. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I think that what really struck me about this is that while all of these, while Docker and Git and all these things, you know, they, they're using the same basic concepts in different ways, Nix took it that step further and said, well, actually, it's just a functional, we're going to use a functional programming language as a configuration and as how we build it. And so it's basically a functional program, and then this is the runtime. They don't actually, I think, ever come out and say that. I, had, I was like, what is, oh, okay, it is kind of just the runtime system. And that was just fascinating to me because it means that they're kind of leveraging all this in a way that everything else isn't. If you look at Docker, for example, it's got Docker files, which I think, how did Paul put it? Like mildly declarative or something like that. Um, and so I wanted to kind of look at this too. Um, it's down here, actually. Yeah. Um, you can kind of see a progression. We started out on just, you know, raw, do whatever you want. We call it IO and Haskell, and we hate it. Uh, and then, you know, things kind of started moving in a more declarative direction once we figured out that having lots of hairy hairballs of shell scripts and <coughs> whatnot is just as bad as, you know, a bunch of basic that calls back to line 10 and everything. Uh, and so, you know, these configuration management systems and Docker have kind of been moving in a more declarative direction. And my one of the things that I'm trying to figure out is, is, is functional programming or some kind of programming language, are we going to pull it back from this brink of, you know, really simple but maybe not really flexible stuff and back into some kind of a more principled realm where we have the benefits of, you know, it's simple, you can introspect over it, whatnot. But it's not just pure random code, machine code running. And so here's a few other examples of this. Um, and I'll, I need to make it a little smaller. Um, yeah. So you know, we started out with Debian rules. Just you know, I'm calling it I/O. I'm just it's ad hoc code. Do whatever you like. Um, this made it. Dev helper made it just a little bit declarative, not too much. Um, and then DH, a little bit more declarative, still not too much. And well, where could we go now? Um, often when people talk to me about a Dev Helper feature, um, just this morning I was answering an email saying, you know, could you please put the uh, multi-arch triple in all the Dev Helper config files? And of course then the question is, what's the syntax? And how do I avoid breaking everything? And, you know, what else is going to go in there. We started feature creep into some direction. And a lot of Dev Helper features have, you know, been put off because of these kind of concerns or something has been thrown together and ad hoc and it's good enough. But, you know, wouldn't it be great if I didn't have to worry about that and I could just give you some reasonable config file syntax that was extensible 
Maybe. Of course, there's also the hack of the executable dev helper config file, which uh, <laughs> the less said about that, the better. <laughs> <laughs> it was right. I started using it everywhere yeah. because there's really nothing well, better. But it's like it's I like mean, the line three, are all go to line one. It's right. The, alter <laughs> the alternatives are all worse. Yeah, uh, like you end up with huge piles of crap over Debian rules to generate. And, and that's the thing. Rules. I mean, when you have declarative stuff, really you end up with you, when you have declarative stuff, you end up repeating yourself. You end up with inefficiencies, and so that's why I think declarative isn't the end point. Um, and again, I, w I was talking, I think, at lunch with Russ the other day, and you know, we were talking about he's wanting to get rid of more maintainer scripts, and you know, we started off with simple, do whatever you like in the script, and Deb Helper kind of factored it out in a way, and then Triggers kind of made it a little bit declarative in a way. So what would functional programming look, look like? Um, and I think that Russ, you actually said something about, well, there should be in a debconf config file, it shouldn't bother, it should just be some simple little domain-specific domain language that maybe parses the config file that it's going to use on the system and can also write to it. And of course, this is, you know, very suited to functional programming, in my opinion. Um, we have things in the functional programming world like parsers and generators that use the same code in a bi-directional way, which is crazy stuff. <laughs> I want to wrap my head around that. Uh, and then let's look at config files. Well, they obviously started out declarative, except for the oddball one, like whatever, bind or something. I have zero one minutes. Thank you. Uh, oh. Yeah, I have 10 on it. Um, and so yeah, I kind of reverted things in the wrong direction with Debconf because I obviously wasn't thinking about big picture stuff. And that's one of the reasons I like this vein of thought. It's given me kind of a framework to think about things. Um, but then we kind of have moved back into some kind of, well, I said it was functional variable mesh. This is, this is obviously a huge stretch to say that just the fact that we can take a set of files and get a file is a functional program. But at least we're thinking about, you know, <laughs> uh, trying to move stuff. And here's an even bigger stretch, which, yeah, um, we used to have IO code that ran in your head. And we, then we went to nice declarative structural code. But then if you actually look at the details, it gets really complicated. You're like, Wow, this is complicated stuff. You could do a lot of stuff with this language. Um, <laughs> so this is probably just, you can probably look at lots of things to get this kind of example. Um, I don't know how, how, interest, how useful this digression at the end was. Um, my main, you know, mainly what I wanted to talk about was the functional runtime, but you, once, you're, once you are thinking about things in terms of a functional runtime, you start thinking about other things like this. Um, so I think I'm pretty much done. If someone would like to see something in NexOS, I can show you or answer questions or whatever. Remner. So just a remark. Um, if you like parentheses, then um, there's a Guile version. Well. Uh, simplifying things, there's a Guile version of Nix as well. Yes, there is, and I, it's kind of cool because it's got a monad and stuff, which Nix doesn't have. Uh, yeah, I, um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I had to work it in somehow. So, uh, so, <laughs> so the the unique developer, I, it doesn't seem to have a big community yet, but is calling it the GNU distribution. Yeah. So, uh, hopefully, it, that's not the kiss of death. It is a GNU project. Well, yeah. yeah. So is BZR. And it's actually fully com <laughs> it's actually fully compatible with Nix on the package level. It's just that they're running different code on top of the same functional runtime. So, yeah. Um, uh, I mean, you said it's, well, just to respond directly to that, it sounds like you're saying it's an independent implementation of the same functional runtime and not different code on top of the functional runtime? Well, I'm saying the code that you run on top of the functional runtime is the <coughs> building of the packages and the configuration of the system, which are written using Scheme. So the okay. Scheme code is running on top of the distribution, which is the runtime. I don't know what the implementations of the actual, I don't really care. Yeah. But my, my, my question is really, inside that Nix... Uh, mm -hmm. Current generation directory, I think it was called. Yeah. Um, how far is that from policy? Other than the ah, sibling yeah. stuff, <laughs> is it somewhat close? Okay, in here. No, not not within each package, but within oh. the union of each package called the right. generation. Okay, <laughs> so I can actually show you where the generation right. is. I think. Um, uh, bah. Yeah. Um, 
you actually, another fun thing about Nix, which I haven't mentioned, is every user on a Nix system can install packages. <laughs> and they just get a directory in their home directory with everything symlinked all together. You can even remove packages if you don't like something the admin has installed. It's nuts. <laughs> it's true. awesome. That's true. Uh, as well. Yeah. And so, and there's no difference. I can go to my Nix profile and here's all the system and yeah, um, I guess it isn't all the system because I don't understand. I forgot to follow symlinks or something, but um, yeah. Um, how policy compliant is it? I think they kind of use the FHS as a point of departure and you know, there's no user share doc or anything, that's for sure. <laughs> there's got to be some better technology <laughs> these days than Simlinks for this stuff, right? I mean, mm -hmm. there's lots of interesting overlay FS file systems mm -hmm. and things that you think you would be able to use to accomplish something like this. Yeah. Because the Simlinks, there's all sorts of really weird problems with Simlinks, and you kind of don't want to use them if you can avoid it. Yeah, I mean, I think they used it because it's lowest common denominator, and use cases really do include running it on OSX and using it as a sane alternative to other OSX things and whatnot. Um, yeah, I mean, and I'm definitely not proposing that we implement this in Debian, but I think we could think about how do Docker containers and something like this and other things fit together and maybe come up with something interesting that would fit in the Debian. Um, yep, here we go. Uh, <coughs> I'm kind of scared by the idea of having to write Haskell to <laughs> Debianize my things. <laughs> but well, um, yeah. I like the idea of making the common stuff declarative. I liked a lot. Okay. Um, it seems like, an, yeah. and it seems to be like a no-brainer of a direction we kind of would, we would all like to go, given on, on the feedback that I got after the Dev Dry talk. Mm -hmm. Everyone's tired of writing everything twice. Uh, and, uh, and there's lots of common things across packages that can really become, uh, like, do what I mean. Mm -hmm. or, or be refactored. We really have a lot of potential for refactoring things that we don't really take advantage of. I'm going to run this back to Colin and make the camera people unhappy. Uh, one one thing I'd like to think about uh, kind of jumps off what Linus was saying last night about uh, about app packaging as well uh, that uh, we we have and it's right and proper uh, always tried to avoid uh, repeating ourselves in terms of uh, people using shared libraries and I think that's right for the distribution regardless of, of what Linda says but for, for app packaging mm -hmm. for uh, the sort of little third party apps that maybe don't have a very long lifetime maybe don't have a very long development cycle it sucks um, and I'd, I'd like some kind of way to to express that much better than we can right now whether that's something like Nix where you you have uh, you have garbage collected uh, versions of something installed in your system, or whether it's some kind of automatic way to bundle everything up into into an app structure. Um, I I haven't surveyed this space very much. Uh, I don't know if there's anything that does that today, but uh, it is something we need to look at. Yeah, yeah, and also it came, it came to my mind that from a security perspective, you also, of course. Besides SUA binaries, you can easily end up in some case where you built something yourself, I believe, and there's no upgrade path without throwing that away and going back to the mainstream. You know, there's all kinds of complications with this system. It's it's a play system that I think mostly Haskell developers use because it solves some of their problems, and you know, it has a few developers and it has a it's all hosted on GitHub and stuff. It's you know. <laughs> yeah, real trendy. Okay. I have a meta question, with, which is if I talk this loud, is it okay to not use a microphone? Uh, no, because no one can hear you. Well, that's my question for the video team. Is this loud enough? I think we have three or four minutes, so probably just whatever. Matter. I thought about speed things up for everyone else. Um, so, yes. great. Uh, how feasible would it be to turn every deb into a Nix package automatically? And well, let you Nix install Debian? Unfortunately, I, I don't think that Josh is in the room. Uh, Josh has basically done this, I think, before. He did something with um, tracking all the inputs 
of packages that got built and then check them in a Git or something. And, and he had a way, it was basically the same basic idea where you have a hash that represents all the inputs of the package. You know, that would be really neat, I suppose. I don't know how you would get all the inputs in the Debian context. Not all the parts match up, do they? Uh, in the next packages? Well, that's the main complication of packaging things this way is you have to make everything relocatable. Every, you know, possible hard-coded thing has to be fixed. There's actually quite a bit of crossover between the problem of how you generate a hash of every possible input into the package and the reproducible built problem, mm -hmm. which also wants to do the same thing. So yeah. Yeah. I Nick's, think we want to solve the know. problem of <laughs> hashing the input yeah. into a Debian package anyway. Yeah. Nix is basically a few patches of GH or GCC. I said GHC. That that too. Away from reproducible builds or you know, yeah. And one other, uh, at least a personal comment. Yes, please make me learn. You write Haskell in order to do something really cool with Debian packaging because <laughs> I've been trying to make my find motivation to learn Haskell for years, <laughs> and you'll give me a really good reason to finally wow. do it. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we have time for one more or so. I have one question kind of along those lines, and you may have touched on this briefly, but uh, you're mentioning embedded domain-specific languages, and we're talking about specific concrete languages like Haskell. Is there a good, this is more of a language design question, is there a good middle ground between pure declarative and you have to understand Haskell's specific quirks around how functions work, how garbage collection works, how, like, you have to learn an actual concrete functional language. Mm -hmm. Is it possible to design an EDSL that works well in multiple functional languages so there can be multiple implementations of it? I think I'm not a language designer either. My feeling is yes. <laughs> 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 yeah, that's basically, I mean, or, or type lambda calculus, whatever. Yeah, I think that's a good point to end. <laughs> <laughs> well, then, thanks. Okay.